Gracious Lord, we have reached that part of worship where we want to hear from you in an invitation, a message. As the scripture pointed out, a prayer that you prayed while on earth, we too want to find our passion and not our worry. Lord, instead of worrying, we want to do what passion and drives us in this culture. So as we come forward to the altar today, Holy Spirit, invite us wanting to pursue our passion, our joys in life, our sweet spot. And help us not be fearful of pursuing that because it's really the gifts you give us that you want us to live out. Open us up to that, Holy Spirit. Open the words of my mouth, not be mine, but yours, Lord. Humbly, but with gratitude and expectation, I ask these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are in the midst of a series called Simplifying Our Lives, and this has been a really good one for me because I kind of tend to get all kinds of plates or things spinning and sometimes have to back up and make sure I remain a little more in front of everything and realizing I don't have to get involved in everything either. It's easy to do that, but simplifying is so much more rewarding. And it's been challenging to, to look at my own daily schedule as I get into these sermons and say, wow, there's always room to simplify, but still be satisfied. And today, as I invite us forward, in the midst of this prayer that Jesus has, he is in the middle of being confronted by the Pharisees, the scribes, because that's who he thought he was really coming to earth for. I mean, after all, he has a passion to introduce the love of God, the gift of God, Emmanuel, God with us. He has that passion burning in him, and he thought the most obvious people that would want to recognize that would be the Pharisees, the chief religious leaders of his day. And the truth is, they're not recognizing that. And we can get a little misdriven that way when we find out our passion isn't working. And, and Jesus is struggling with that in this prayer. A little bit. Just a little bit. And you and I sometimes, we have a passion. And if we had our choice, we would make a living at our passion, wouldn't we? I mean, if we had our choice, we'd make a living at whatever our passion is. Some of us are doing that. But it's hard to do. It's hard to, to do that in time to time because we, we kind of get... Oh, into that passion, well, I can't make a living at it. But then also certain people try to make a living at their passion in many, many ways. Some, this one gentleman's passion was sleeping. That was his passion. And he had a college degree and he was applying for a job. And, and the inner person interviewing him said, I'm sorry, but you're just overqualified for the position we're trying to hire for. And he was just begging her to hire him anyways. And finally he said, I tell you, I promise you that if you hire me for your organization, what little work I will do, you won't even know I'm around. <laughs> Sometimes our passions can get misguided too. But the real question I want to ask today is, think about what your passion is. I mean, really think about what your passion is. Now, often, we, if we want to make a living at that passion, we want to make money at it, we have to be realistic. Many years ago, I realized that one of my passions is snow skiing and specifically mogul competitions. I used to do that. And one night, I was watching the Olympics. This goes way back when the Olympics was in Salt Lake City. It was probably 2000 or something like that. And I was watching the skiing, the, the Winter Olympics, and the mogul competition and they were really good, and Kelly was with me, and I said, all of a sudden I looked and, and said, arrogantly speaking, well, I can do that, and Kelly said, without missing a beat, then why aren't you doing it in the Olympics? <laughs> you already know the answer to that. <laughs> Sometimes we get into these passions, like, well, I can't make a living there, but we can if we think about it. If we really want to do what we want to do and not have all this stress and worry in life, we choose to make a passion and what we love to do. I had a young teen, he was about 14, 15 years old, went up to the Boundary Waters with me for his first time, and he got up there, he was one of these boys who loved to hunt. He was passionate about it, I mean that. 
He was at home in the woods. He loved to deer hunt, turkey hunt, duck hunt. He loved to fish. He loved to fish for bass. He loved to fish for northern pike. He got up to the Boundary Waters for his first time, and he fell in love with it. Couldn't get enough of it. I was going up every year back then, and he was all ready to go and getting friends to go. He graduated from high school, southeast Minnesota. Went straight up to Ely, where there is a community college. And in that college in Ely, some of you already know, this is a well-known college program there for the Department of Natural Resources, a forestry degree. He went right to college, he graduated, and now he lives in Ely, he has a family up there, and he works for the Department of Natural Resources. And whenever you look at him up on Facebook, he's in his mid-30s now, I think at least in his mid-30s, and he always is smiling, always smiling. When he's dressed in his uniform, he's smiling. The reason he's doing that is because he has found where his passion and culture, and I would even add his call of God, come together in the intersections of life. And so you and I just ask that simple question, what is our passion? Jesus kind of answers that in this prayer. And he looks at it. I'm going to bypass that. He looks at it. And he kind of gets caught up in his passion. His passion was to introduce people to Christ. He had nothing more than that. That was his love. And, and by meaning that was, what his passion was in that way was not just introducing people to Christ. That's, that's fairly easy. But in connection with that, he had a passion with wanting people to know that they are forgiven. He wanted people to know that he was going to use the cross as an instrument of grace. And he wanted people to know that they didn't have to carry this baggage around in life, always knowing that they're not forgiven and they're never going to be good enough. His passion was helping people know they are forgiven. And he went to the first logical people that would, you think, understand that, and that would be his, the religious leaders of the day, the priests and the Pharisees. And instead of believing him, those logical people that you'd think would believe him rejected him. They said, there's no way you're going to deliver grace and forgiveness. There's no way you're the actual Son of God like the Scriptures teach us because we just aren't ready for that yet. And that's where we pick up this prayer. And he begins to pray after being rejected. At that time, Jesus said, and this is in the form of a prayer... I thank you, Father, Lord in heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise, the Pharisees and the scribes, and the intelligent, and have revealed them to the infants. He's talking about people he didn't even think would, he would be ministering to because he thought first it would be the Pharisees and the scribes. And now he's realizing, wait, my passion is for the ones that have been kicked out of the church. My passion is for the ones that the Pharisees and the scribes have gotten so lofty, so intellect, they can't even reach. My passion is for the ones that are growing and yearning for forgiveness, but the church has rejected them. And he's beginning, beginning to find that sweet spot of passion in the midst of his prayer. And all of a sudden, you and I are asked, well, if we really want to get into it, what is my passion in life? And how is that meeting me in both the culture of life that I'm in and what I'm doing in life? You know, there's nothing worse, and this I, I meet people that, that are in this type of world, there's nothing worse where a person is extremely gifted at doing what they hate, they can't stand, but they do it because they're making a lot of money. You with me? They get really good at something, but they get bored stiff with it, but they can't quit because they're caught up in the paycheck that it brings, and they don't want to get out of it because they like the paycheck that it brings. They're bored with their work. They can't handle it, but they like the paycheck. And all of a sudden, you and I are caught up in really looking at Jesus and saying, am I really doing my passion? You know, a, a person that's doing their passion is what I would call a great teacher. A great teacher is somebody who works in our school system 
Everybody loves, the children love because they get the point across. They can take a child's challenge and say, I'm going to help you learn, and that child learns. And they don't, they don't spend their life teaching, arguing about the low pay. They don't spend their life teaching, arguing about the bureaucracy of teaching and the diplomatic problems that come with teaching. Instead, they just love the children. And they continue and continue to love the children. I have people at Grace Church that are volunteering with our finances right now. I am not a financial guru. I promise you that. If you don't believe me, ask anybody on the finance team. They told me, stay away from the numbers, Bob. <laughs> Good reason. But I have people that are volunteering with our finances. You know what? They make the numbers dance. And I say that as a gift because they can take a problem and they spend hours and they get it solved because they love to work in that area. People are volunteering at the Uzo. Kids that don't have a place to go, they bring love to the U-Zone, and not just to that building, but to children. These are people that find their passion, and they put it into the culture, and they end up worrying less. Jesus speaks to that, as he finds that, in the prayer he goes on, he says, All things have been handed over to me by the Father. This is why I'm here is to introduce Christ in grace and forgiveness, and I love it. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Now I get that. And so I want people to know the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and I get that. So I want to introduce myself to people. Just because the Pharisees and scribes don't like me, there's a whole world out there waiting for me to find forgiveness. And to anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal himself. I guess really the challenge is, does my passion challenge me? Am I in that place? I do not golf. So forgive me as I go into a golfer world. I hope I get the terms right. I am not a golfer. I tried it. I have successfully hit another person on another fairway once, but I really haven't hit the green. Actually, I was trying to hit that person too. I will admit that. It was much more of a challenge than hitting a dumb green. So, but what I hear about golfing, I've heard this from golfers. They put the ball on the, on the um, what's that thing that you tee off, that's it, on the tee. Okay, they put the ball on the tee, and then they pull out a driver. And if you're really good at golf, they take that driver and they swing it, and as soon as it makes contact with the ball, the golf ball, as soon as it makes contact, they know they hit it right because of the sound of the hit. The sound kind of whistles, and they call that the sweet spot. You with me if you golf? You hit it, and the sound whistles. They don't even have to look at the ball. They know as soon as they hear that sound, they're like, that's going to be good because that's the sweet spot. You know what Jesus is getting at here? He's getting at the sweet spot when we can take our passions in the culture we live in and have them meet. You know what that is? That's not worries. That's called the sweet spot in life. Let me see if I can actually point that out personally to you before I end this invitation. When I came to Camp Coronas as a high school kid, many of you, some of you may not be aware, but many of you were, I asked Christ into my heart. That was a big deal. That was a passion. And all of a sudden I felt a call into ministry. I really did. I was one of those who asked Christ into my heart, filled with the Holy Spirit, and wanted a call into ministry all at the same year. A couple of years after that would go by, two, three years, I'd come to Camp Coronas now as both a counselor or a speaker or a camp evangelist for the week. And I remember I would take a canoe, they had the canoes, and I would take them out in what I call Coronas Bay out there, and I would sit out there some nights by myself, and I'm not making this up, and I would daydream. I didn't even know, by the way, I didn't know there was a United Methodist Church in Painesville then. I, it was probably 20 years ago. Pastor Kane was just beginning to preach then because he's been here like 30 years, right? Okay. <laughs> I didn't know there was a Grace United Methodist. I didn't know what churches were in Painesville. Back then, Willie Shields Hotel was still a hotel. That, that, um, that repair shop that's in the Amico gas station, that was an Amico gas station back then. And I'd sit in that bay, I'm not making this up, and I would daydream about the possibility, Lord... Do you think I'll ever be a minister here at Camp Coronas or at, at, at the church, whatever churches they have here? Do you think I'll ever do that? And all of a sudden, I'm telling you how passion and culture come together. 
I also used to daydream times. You think I'll ever be able to use my skiing ministry, my skiing skills for you, Lord? Back in May, I got a call from a gentleman in, in Tennessee, North, or actually in North Carolina. And he is a former pro wakeboarder. And years ago, he started a ministry all over the 50 or the lower 48 states where he brings wakeboard ski boats to a place for a day called Wake the World. And he invites all kinds of children in, cost free, places like people like Thrivent Financial and other places to sponsor the day financially. He invites children in cost free to teach them how to wakeboard, barefoot, well, not really barefoot, but ski, kneeboard, and two. So they can have a godly, Christ centered day. Because they may not have that in their home. He calls me up and he says, are you Pastor Candles? Called here at Grace Church. Yes, I am. So I understand you're kind of a ski nut. I said, rumor has it. <laughs> and he told me, I'm Greg from South Carolina. And I want to have a thing called Wake the World at Lake Coronas. Can you help me? I said, I think I can. And all of a sudden we have this event going on at Coronas Ministry. I don't know about you, but the reason I tell you is not to build me up. I'm trying to tell you is don't be afraid to follow your passions. You want less worry? Follow your passions. I've been a huge one to say, don't worry about your weakness, okay? The weak parts are always going to be weak. That's life. Shine in your skills. Because God has given us through the Holy Spirit passions and gifts. We all have them. Some of them are in numbers. Some are with teaching. Some are with um, media, social media. Some are with uh, decorating. Some are with cleaning. Some are with hospitality. Some are, are with lawn care or landscaping. Follow your skills, what you love to do. And don't be afraid to pursue them in life. Jesus ends this prayer extremely interesting. He understands what his passion is, introducing Christ to people. And then he realizes there's a lot more others out there that want passion. And don't worry if you're retired or not. That's not an excuse. Okay? You still have passion. Trust me. I've seen you. All right? And Jesus says, don't worry about the fear of pursuing your passion. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to have a friend that was in a rut. He's going to explain. I'm going to interview him. He was making all kinds of money. He was very successful, but he hated it. He hated it. And he finally got to the point where he's now doing something he loves. It's a lot less money, but he loves it. I'll save that for another Sunday. But that takes a lot of leap of faith. And Jesus says to us in this prayer, Come to me, all of you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens. I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke. You know the farmers, you know what I mean by the yoke they used to have around the oxen. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me. My yoke is gentle. It's not heavy and humble at heart. It's full of grace and forgiveness. And you will find rest for your souls. I'm challenging us to come forward today, no matter what place and season we are in life, to find our passion. And make sure that we get that to a sweet spot. Make sure that passion crosses our culture. And we find that sweet spot in life. Amen.